So what we're going to do today is we're going to install K3S on my Raspberry Pi 3 and we're going to do a bit of a lag testing because I've had a few people complain of using CubeADM CubeADM and finding it to be a little bit laggy taking three to four seconds to do something like list pods. So we'll start off by logging into the Raspberry Pi that I provisioned earlier. Now I already copied my SSH key into this and I've changed the default password. The other thing that I've done is I've rebalanced the memory so that only 16 meg is used for the GPU. Now you may be familiar with my blog post, Will It Cluster? I'll put this on the, the video. And basically, once you've got your hardware, you flash your card, you're logging in, we're basically about here. We now want to bootstrap K3S onto the Raspberry Pi. And we can just see how long this particular step takes. Interesting. Perhaps we're missing something here. So that's great. There's a, obviously, is that a bug in my blog post? It should be get K3S. Okay, we'll get that fixed. So we're downloading 061. That seems quite recent. And this installation shouldn't take too long. And what it does is it starts a system D service for us called K3S. That's on the server. If you're on another computer, another Raspberry Pi connecting in, it's called K3S agent. As part of this, we're going to see the control plane for Kubernetes being pulled down from the internet. So that's a little bit dependent on my internet connection. It's also got some dependencies on the IO of the Raspberry Pi and how quickly um, Containerd can write those Docker images that are needed or OCI images to the SD card. Certainly when I did this with my Raspberry Pi 4, I think it was much quicker. And I'll add a link in the in the notes for my Raspberry Pi 4 video where I did this. So while that's running, it's taking rather longer than I was expecting. We can look at how we would then go off and find the, the node token for the server. And we can join other Raspberry Pis in. And it might be that there's a mix of Raspberry Pi 3 and 4. That's absolutely fair game because they are going to be running um, Raspbian in this instance, Buster, and that is what we call ARM v7. Now, if you have a mixture of ARM and regular PCs, then things get quite complicated quite fast. So I'd recommend getting a cluster where all of the nodes are like one another, rather than what is sometimes called multi-arch or heterogeneous. Okay, so there we go. Now. What we can do is system CTL, and this is a tool that lets us check different services. We get the status, um, we appear to be up and running. Something that somebody taught me recently is that there's a cat command for K3S, well, for system CTL, and that prints out the system D unit file that was created to start the, the daemon automatically every time the computer reboots. And we see this environment file has additional configuration that we might use, it's protected. Um, so let's go ahead and grab the, the token. We won't need it, but let's just see where it is. So because we're just using one computer, we don't actually need this. We want to connect more, we would. The difference between um, the way K3S ships um, and the way that perhaps um, KubeADM works is KubeADM will tend to always um, block the master node from running any workloads. Here, let's see how long is this going to take. We want to get the nodes. It's taking a significant amount of time. If 
Perhaps let's try it again. Now a recent change is that a recent change is that you have to use Q, you have to use sudo with kubectl because um, the guys at Rancher in their wisdom decided that they weren't going to allow um, kubectl to work otherwise. And so you end up getting this permission error. Perhaps what's happening right there is maybe some of the pods that we need were actually still being pulled down from the internet. So let's put sudo. And this is perhaps one of the things that, as a new Kubernetes user, you might find particularly confusing is that you install something like this, you get some vague error messages, and it just doesn't work. Um, it would be nice if somehow the K3S install would block and wait, or at least tell you how to find out when this is exactly ready. OK, so let's go. It seems to be up. Let's run a timer on that. So two and a half seconds. Certainly if I was running this on something like DigitalOcean or GKE, I'd expect this to return almost immediately. Now I'm actually on my local network, but I'm also on the device itself. And there's only one node. Let's see what pods we have. And I'm going to look in all namespaces. If you're not familiar with uh, the concept of namespaces, this is something that we often uh, often use to look across the system. And there's a shortcut of dash A, which I only learned recently, that effectively does the same thing and saves you a lot of typing. So it looks like there's a couple of things to do with traffic, which is an ingress controller that's still pulling down, maybe some images. OK. Now, in my blog post, I had an example of how you could just set up a very simple um, service. This isn't technically uh, a function as such, it's just a Kubernetes microservice. It happens to use some function code that we've put together in OpenFAS. And what we can do is say um, apply anything that you get from standard in, and then prefix that with cat. And this is quite useful for copying and pasting examples from blog posts. That's created our service definition. We then want to put a deployment behind that. And the deployment is what will pull the pod down. And it was going to go functions figlet. And once I've, once I've hit enter, I'm hitting control D. And that tells cat to stop listening for input. Um, and then there's this command here, kubectl rollout status. And it can basically tell you whether the deployment is up and up and running whether it's ready. The other way of checking that, as many people normally use, is let's use this all namespaces deploy. And again, this is quite abrasive having to type in sudo every time you use kubectl. It's not particularly a normal workflow, um, but I think I can live with it. And we see um, actually zero out of one are ready number of reasons why that might be. Perhaps the image is being pulled down from the internet. So we can do kubectl describe deploy. And because this is in the default namespace, we don't need to specify that. Again, I need that sudo. OK, what have we got? So there's no particular events at the moment for that. Another place that we can look in is kubectl get events. And by default, the events are not ordered, which is really annoying. So if you look in the OpenFAS docs, we actually have something that I like to go back to, which um, gives you basically the, what I should try and memorize which is this command sort by metadata creation timestamp. Now we'll get the exact order that all these events came in at. So the node came up. We scheduled the pod, which means we asked for it. A uh, replica set was created. We were pulling the image. And then the image was pulled. You can see how long ago that was. So what was that 30 odd seconds to pull that image down? We then created and then started the pod. So if we do our get again, 
we see we now have one out of one replicas. Now the point of the command I used in the blog post is that this will actually block until that becomes ready. Um, and in this case, we see that it effectively came back immediately because we know that's up and running. So if we wanted to run something else, and then this command can help us block until we know that's healthy and running. So what do we do next? Right, well, because there was a node port on the service, I can show you that service. And it's mapping to port 31111. We can actually call that on the local host IP address, but also remotely. So first of all, we'll try it this way. And it executed. Now the other way we can do this is not on a local host, but from my computer using its network adapter 192.168.0.40. And in this case, because the input ran on, on the local computer where we ran this, it's printing out the architecture of my Mac Mini. And we run it on the device, it's printing out the architecture of the device itself. So how's our get pods now for timing? Let's get pods in all namespaces. That's actually pretty fast. And it might be that what was happening while we were looking at this earlier was that there was some IO on the device. Um, for instance, we could have been actually pulling some of those images down that we needed. And now get nodes is running in about half a second. Get pods in the default namespace is about 0 0.6 and in all namespaces around the same. Okay, so one of the other things that I've updated the blog to do is to allow you just to deploy the whole of OpenFAS instead. Um, now let me see if, where this is. I believe it's this one. Try serverless. We could just put something in here just to make it spin around a little bit. First of all, when you type in git, you'll realize that git is not available on the stretch, um, on the light distribution. I wish it was there because I pretty much always need git. Let's give this a couple of seconds. The longest part of this kind of thing is normally updating the man page. Then we'll clone the Fasnetis repo, which is where we've got the distribution for Kubernetes. The raw YAML files is what we use here instead of Helm and Tiller because there is actually no, um, at present, no official Tiller distribution. Um, Helm maintainers, if you're listening, it would be great to get that. There is an unofficial version, but I do worry about using that sort of thing. Let's wait for this to finish. It's going to take a couple more moments. Incidentally, if you've not starred the project, that's something you could do while you're waiting. Um, Fasnetis there and Faz. Those are the, probably the main two repos at the moment. Okay, so let's go ahead and clone that. OpenFAS ships with two namespaces. So we saw that the namespaces earlier were default and cube system. We're actually going to put two more in there. And again, we've got to prefix all of this with sudo. There we go. We've got two new namespaces. And now we can apply the YAML files that are um, going to install all the different bits we need for OpenFAS.
Again, I think this is one of the places where we're seeing some of that latency that people have reported. Certainly on Raspberry Pi uh, 4, this seems much, much faster. In fact, perhaps while we wait for that, we could have a quick look at the Raspberry Pi 4. And I believe we should be able to get into one here. So let's see what the timing is like to get the nodes. And here I've actually got two nodes. So the first time there's a bit of lag and then it's about at least twice as fast as what it was on the other, on the Raspberry Pi 3. Let's get the pods. Again, I guess this is around 50% quicker, maybe a bit more. And this is with a cluster that actually has some, some workloads. It's like partially loaded. Um, the Raspberry Pi 3 at the moment doesn't have much running on it. So we can see this is quite, I think this is quite reasonable. 0 0.3 seconds feels quite responsive to me. Okay, then down in the bottom half of the screen, we've got a whole bunch of objects that have been created in Kubernetes. We're gonna have Prometheus, Alert Manager, and that's streaming the OpenFAS gateway, and um, a few other bits and pieces that make up the project. So let's see what pods we've got across all of the namespaces. Now this time it's taking quite a bit longer. It's taking a significant amount of time in fact. I believe in human interaction design, if something takes longer than six or seven seconds, people will often assume that it's failed. That's kind of how I'm feeling at the moment. And I guess um, something to do with the amount of IO or CPU needed to pull down these four or five containers at once is what choked this up here. And it's really up to you whether you feel that you can live with that kind of latency. Um, it could particularly affect the performance of the system if you then go and deploy a new application or microservice and suddenly kubectl is timing out at, at 10 seconds. Okay. So this will take a little while and really it's more about the IO of the Raspberry Pi and the size of the Docker images that need to be pulled down than anything to do with the CPU right now. Um, once that's up and running, you'd then be able to complete the rest of this tutorial where you can go through user CLI. Um, I don't think we quite have time to sit and wait for this now, but I hope this gives you an idea of just some of the um, kind of latency that you might get with a Raspberry Pi 3. One of the other things that I can show you just before we finish is most kubectl commands can take a watch flag. And what this is doing is giving us all of the events that are seen across a certain namespace. Um, this is the default namespace. What we could actually do is look at the open fast namespace and we should see a bunch of these Docker images being pulled down, started up and then scheduled because we've only got one Raspberry Pi, they're gonna try and fit in the memory of that single Raspberry Pi. On my Raspberry Pi 4, there's two of them, and there it's got more room and ability to balance it. In fact, what we can see here is that um, being perhaps a little bit overzealous with the memory allocation for Prometheus and ask for 512 megs of RAM. And what this is saying is it cannot be scheduled. Now, if you ever get this, one of the things that you can do is you can describe node or nodes, and this will tell you whether you're overcommitted in any way. So requesting 639 megs of RAM to be on the safe side, and we can actually see what it is that's asked for that RAM. Um, Prometheus doesn't appear to be listed at the moment, perhaps because it can't be scheduled. Let's look at the deployments. Okay, things are not looking good. Let's go and tell Prometheus that it can work in less RAM. I'm gonna edit the deployment. And if we look down, 
we should see a request for the container 512 megs you know Prometheus can use this amount it can even use more than that but let's just go and tell it that you just need to request 128 megs and things will probably be all right okay so how are we doing on our events if I make that change well one of the other pods has just been pulled down that uh, that we need and once the system has worked out that it now has enough memory to schedule Prometheus it will try again and we'll get up and running so we just look like we created the container for alert manager it's now actually pulling the image for Prometheus so it didn't actually even pull the image because it didn't think there was enough RAM for it um, Prometheus isn't a huge image but it will take probably a couple of minutes to come down and then we'll see that we've probably got enough resources now this is one of the main reasons why we need Raspberry Pis or ARM devices with more than one gigabyte of RAM because you really shouldn't need three Raspberry Pis just to run Kubernetes but this is the state of things right now so I'd minimum recommend two gigs maybe four and if you do have Raspberry Pi 3 as I have a lot of them myself when you connect them all together you can spread the load out okay so I hope this was interesting and we've we'll probably do one quick check of the pods again just for a timing so there's our pods quite responsive at the moment and let's get our nodes not too bad not too bad at all and then I guess it comes down to what you want to use this for to be realistic one Raspberry Pi is probably not going to cut it with K3S or CubeADM um, you're going to need a few and then if you've got anything CPU intensive just test it out and see if it's up to scratch um, it's very easy to deploy this stuff on the cloud and set up a Kubernetes cluster there as well. Great. All right. Well, hope it's been useful. If you need me, you can find me on Twitter, Alex Ellis UK. And you can also get all of my latest blogs and posts there.